Hello, BookTube. I have yet another random pile of books I want to show you. I swear. <laughs> no other reason than that. No great organizing principle. This channel exists to bombard you with random piles of books. Chat about them a little, and then tootle off. <laughs> Some of these might appeal to you more than they appeal to me. We'll take a look at them and see what, we, what they have to offer. I'm kind of like the sexy version of Jack Edwards in this regard. <laughs> so, the first one we see, we'll see here is a finished copy. I believe this is a July release. A finished copy of something we've already seen. This is The Mistress of Batya House by Sujata Masi. Look at that cover. How wonderful. Uh, this is a series of, of uh, murder mysteries set in India of a century ago, starring a female lawyer. Well, the only one in the country when the series starts. Uh, and this is the finished copy. I don't think... Oh, I do have a sheet for this. These Purveen mystery novels are so good. And this is like number three. Is that right? Uh, yeah. The Widows of Malabar Hill is the first one. The Satipur Moonstone and the Bombay Prince. So this is number four. So that's not much. If your library has this series, you could catch up this summer and have another series that's ongoing that you're that you're loving, because you will love it, trust me. Uh, let's see here. Women's medical rights lend modern relevance to this enthralling historical mystery set in 1922 Bombay. Purveen Mystery, that's our main character, is the only female lawyer in Bombay, a city where child mortality is high, birth control is unavailable, and very few women have ever seen a doctor. Purveen is attending a lavish fundraiser for a new women's hospital specializing in maternal health when she witnesses an accident. The grandson of an influential businessman catches fire, but a servant rushes to save him, selflessly putting herself in harm's way. Later, Purveen learns that the servant, who's still ailing from her burns, has been arrested on trumped-up charges made by a man who doesn't seem to exist. And these things have wonderful twists and turns, and the main character has a terrific personality. So these are, this is a, a really, uh, yeah, this is the middle of July. This is a really winning murder series. Uh, if you don't know it already, I've, I've, I've been praising this thing on this channel since book number one. Uh, and I've been loving it. I've been under its spell from the whole of its time. So I wanted to show you that. Then we'll do some uh, hyperventilating overheated YA. Can't do without hyperventilating overly overheated YA. And it's for the gays. Can't do without the gays either. This is by Mike Albo, and it's called Another Dimension of Us. Uh, with with uh, back cover illustration there. So you've got, got a sense around thing here. I don't think I have a sheet for this. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, but let's see. Let's see what we have here. I don't have a sheet, so I don't know when this is out. But I imagine it's July. Uh, in 1986, Tommy Gay, that's G-A-Y-E, is in love with his best friend, budding teen poet Rinaldo Calabasas. But at the height of the AIDS crisis and amidst the homophobia running rampant across America, Tommy can never share his feelings. Then one terrible night, Rinaldo is struck by lightning <laughs> and emerges as, from the storm as a very different boy. In 2044, so we're bookending here, this goes back 40 years and forward 40 years. Uh, in 2044, Heron High student Pris DeVries jolts awake after having a strange nightmare about a boy named Tommy in a, and a house in the neighborhood the locals affectionately call the Murder House. When she ventures to the house to better understand her vivid dreams, she happens upon an old self-help book that she soon realizes is a guide to interdimensional travel. Uh, as bodies and minds merge across the astral plane, Pris, Tommy, and their friends race to save Ronaldo from a dangerous demon while uncovering potent realities about love, sexuality, and friendship. That sounds uh, pretty heady. <laughs> so so uh, that's, if, you, if you've got a sweet tooth, maybe, maybe uh, somewhere in your mind it's still 2010 <laughs> and you were dealt with a sweet tooth for YA, well, then you're going to know that this is coming out uh, soon, or is out already. Uh, then we have the, the finished copy of something that we've seen on this channel a couple of times before. This is Michael Finkel's book, uh, The Art Thief, a true story of love, crime, and a dangerous obsession. The bat on the cover there. And I've only got a little uh, old-fashioned publicity card in here, not a bombardment of paperwork. And, you know, uh, I would love it if these came back. <laughs> I would absolutely love it. It doesn't take a, re a book reviewer long to research a book and figure out what they've got in their hand. They could read the first chapter, for Pete's sake. Or you could write 
you can include the dust jacket copy in the ARC. You don't need this. Used to be all that you got with a review copy. It's just uh, the ISBN, the date, the price, oftentimes the page count, that sort of thing. But anyway, let's see what we have here. We've talked about this a couple of times. I think this is a late June release. Uh, so very late June, like the 27th or 28th. So if this gets coverage from people after publication, it will show up in July. I will probably cover it in July. Uh, for centuries, works of art have been stolen in countless ways, but no one has been as successful at stealing art as master thief Stefan Brettweiser. Carrying out more than 200 brazen heists over 10 years in museums and churches across Europe, Brettweiser, along with his girlfriend, who served as a lookout, stole more than 300 works of art, including an estimated 2 billion in total, before the unprecedented crime spree fell apart in spectacular fashion. In this book, the author brings us into Brett Weiser's bizarre and fascinating world. Unlike most thieves, he never stole for money. <coughs> Instead, he displayed all his treasures in a pair of secret rooms where he could admire them to his heart's content. Possessed of a remarkable athleticism and an innate ability to circumvent nearly any security system, he managed to pull off a breathtaking number of audacious thefts. Yet these unusual talents bred a growing disregard for risk and an addict's need to score. Leading Brettweiser to ignore his girlfriend's pleas to stop until one final act of hubris brought everything crashing down. So true crime and also the art world. I, a fantastic combination. Uh, what have we got here? Okay, here's another, uh, another novel. Uh, this is another debut novel. We saw a, a debut novel in my last completely random pile of books. Now we're seeing another one. This is by David Connor, and it is called Oh God, the Sun Goes. Lovely U.S. cover. Just lovely. Uh, so this comes out on August 1st. Uh, let's see. Here. This is an elusive and atmospheric novel set in the parched landscape of American Southwest, a world in which the sun has disappeared from the sky. A wayward traveler sets his course through Arizona to locate the errant star, but finds himself caught in a web of illusion and mystery. A shifting astral mindscape. There's astral again. The astral plane's getting a little crowded here. Uh, that shimmers with both the aftermath of loss and the promise of redemption. Oh God, the Sun Goes is a hallucinatory and deadpan picaresque that suddenly gives way to a love story of soaring poignance. Okay. <laughs> uh, apocalyptic, mesmerizing, utterly unique, and ripe with the author's original illustrations, this book introduces readers to a young and keenly inventive mind. Okay, it's not utterly unique. Okay, <laughs> I'm not going to be five pages in here before, not not five pages into this thing, before I'm going to be able to give you a long, double-column, single-space type list of books that are just like this. <laughs> no, you, you can't do anything unique. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to execute it well. But I'm kind of curious to see these illustrations, now that we've been told that there are illustrations all throughout. What's that I hear? A siren in these parts? I can't remember the last time. Land of Goshen. Uh, okay, I'm not seeing any illustrations there, uh, David. I thought this was full of your illustrations. I'm not seeing any illustrations at all. Is this the finished copy, is it not? Yes, this is the finished copy. Well, uh, I imagine all we made clear. <laughs> this, this comes out on August 1st. Uh, a debut novel, another debut novel. I absolutely love debut novels, so... We'll give this a try. I don't think this next one is a debut novel. Uh, we'll have to give it, have to give it a look-see here. Do I have a sheet of paper for you, my dear? No, I don't. Oh, my. No, I don't. I have another one of these little cards. Great. This is by Carolyn O'Donoghue, and this is The Rachel Incident. Another great cover. I don't know what's going on with American book covers here. It's, it's just can't, you can't go wrong. Uh, so, well, okay, what, what do you have to tell me? Uh, this comes out at the end of June. Uh, are you the authors? Are you a debut, my dear? So, what else do we have by the? Oh no, okay, no, you're no, not a debut. Uh, this author's written YA novels and also uh, adult novels. So, uh, let's see what we have here. Uh, a brilliant, funny novel about friends, lovers, Ireland in chaos, and a young woman desperately trying to manage all three. I thought sure that was going to say desperately managing, trying to manage all three on the astral plane. I thought sure that's what it was going to say. Rachel is a student working at a bookstore when she meets James and it's love at first sight. 
effervescent and insistently heterosexual. James soon involves. I'm glad he's made up his mind. <laughs> James soon invites Rachel to be his roommate, and the two begin a friendship that changes the course of both their lives forever. Okay, why would you need to mention that he's heterosexual? Uh, anyway, try together they run riot through the streets of Cork City, trying to, to maintain a bohemian existence while the threat of financial crash looms before them. When Rachel falls in love with her married professor, Dr. Fred Byrne, James helps her devise a reading at their local bookstore with the hope that she might seduce him afterward. But Fred has other desires. Fred's desires are immaterial, and James and Rachel are horrible people. And it's nice that we know that. We get that out of the way before we've even read a single word. Uh, uh, Fred's desires are immaterial. He has sworn an oath. If he divorces his wife, well, then his desires come into play. As long as he's a married man, they don't come into play. He's sworn an oath. And Rachel and James are suborning him to break that oath. They are suborning him to cheat, to break his family. Uh, but anyway, let's continue. So begins a series of secrets and compromises that intertwine the fates of James, Rachel, Fred, and Fred's glamorous but well-connected bourgeois wife. Aching with unrequited love, shot through with delicious sparkling humor, the Rachel incident is a triumph of horrible unethical people. Um, I guess, well, I, I won't, I don't have to root for them to read about them, right? What, what do we have to say about our author here? Uh, Carolyn O'Donoghue is a New York Times bestselling author of All Our Hidden Gifts, her YA debut fantasy. Did any of you read All Our Hidden Gifts? I'm not calling a cover to mind at all. Uh, which has been published in more than 20 countries around the world. Good Lord! <laughs> Good Lord! That's amazing. She has written for the Times of London, The Guardian, and is the host of an award-winning podcast, Sentimental Garbage. She was born in Ireland and lives in London. The Rachel Incident is her first adult novel to be published in the United States. Interesting. Okay, so these other novels uh, for, for adults, Promising Young Women and Scenes of a Graphic Nature, I'm gathering those only came out in the UK. Uh, we shall see. Uh, let's, oh, shall we sample this author's work? Uh, what is the, what does the opening seem like? Uh, it was never my plan to write about any of this. I know journalists say that all the time, but for me, it's true. Almost all of us are sitting on some big life experience that we're hoping to turn into a book one day. I swear to God, that was never my intention. The process of bookmaking was demystified for me at the age of 21, and I have no instinct to be in any way involved in them since. Okay, is that is that Rachel, or is that our author, who also has a history in journalism? Uh, good Lord, don't tell me that this is autofiction. And if it if it's autofiction, then judging by the nature of that plot, it means it's revenge autofiction. Let's, let's read the beginning of chapter one proper and see if we can dig ourselves out of this hole. Uh, I only ever really talk about Dr. Byrne with James Devlin. And so I always assumed that were he to ever come back into my life, it would be through James. I was wrong. He came via the toy show. The Late Late Toy Show is an annual Irish TV event whereby small children review the year's best toys and advise other children what to put on their Santa list. It's a big deal if you're a child in Ireland, and a bigger deal if you're an Irish adult who lives abroad. It's a hard thing to explain to outsiders. This, in itself, is part of the appeal. Either you get it or you don't. You're one of us or you're not. Perhaps it's because so many people claim Irishness that we keep putting our private jokes on higher and higher shelves, so you have to ask a member of the staff to get them down for you. All over the world, there are group screenings when, where Irish adults cheer for five-year-olds testing out Polly Pockets on live TV, I am an editor at the Hibernian Post, a newspaper for the Irish in Britain. It is my job to write about expat movements, and therefore it is my job to write about the toy show. Okay, that's very good. Uh, that's very good. I kind of want to, I'm going to resist the urge, but I kind of want to look on uh, Carolyn O'Donoghue's Facebook feed, or Twitter feed, and see if there are posts about an affair she had with a married professor. Really... I'm going to not do that, but I'd, I'm hoping that none of that is true. Uh, but anyway, the racial indictment, or incident, the racial incident, I've got indictment on the mind. Uh, the racial incident uh, comes out in late June. Shaky cam going on here. What you doing, baby? You digging? Oh, you're digging like a little gopher. Oh, goodness. What are you doing? 
Want to make that more comfortable? Not really having much of an effect on it. Frida, <laughs> you're mainly just treading water there. No? What are you doing? Oh, what are you doing? Now you're going to work on the pillow? Oh. Oh, no. I thought we were coming in for a landing there. But no. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Oh, goodness. What's the matter, baby? Huh? What's the matter? You get comfortable? All right. Uh, and then one more. One more book, and then we'll be done with this. Uh, not just another random pile of books for you. This is Wolf Boy is Scared by Andy Harkness. It's a kid's book, obviously. Uh, what are you doing, Pete? Your, your butt is in the air here. <laughs> what are you doing? Why don't you settle down? Uh, I think I have a sheet for this thing. Uh, do, I, do I have a sheet for you? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So this comes out... In mid-July. This is a mid-July book. Uh, and is a sequel to Wolf Boy. There is, I think there's a picture here to show you. Yeah, that. It's a sequel to Wolf Boy. That is Wolf Boy on the cover. And this is Wolf Boy is Scared. And Wolf Boy on the cover is assuring you, I'm not. <laughs> uh, and this is, uh, the only way for Wolf Boy to get home before Moonset is by sneaking through the Grumble Monster's lair. There is no problem. This is not a problem for Wolf Boy, who's super brave and totally not afraid of anything. But the rabbits should walk ahead. Wolf Boy needs to watch their back, after all. Wait, are those monster claws? Are those monster eyes? Maybe Wolf Boy is scared. <laughs> so, a charming kid's book. Here, let me show you some of what these pictures do. Where they're, they're walking into the woods. And these things, the illustrations might strike you as a little bit odd, and there's a good reason for that. The author actually tells us uh, what the reason is. Uh, there's a note at the beginning of the book called A Note on the Art. Wait till you hear this. Uh, these illustrations were created by wearing a visual reality headset. Each page is meticulously sculpted inside a VR workspace in much the same way I would sculpt with real clay. That sculpture is then imported into another program where photograph textures of my real clay are applied, fingerprints and all. I then add in lighting in a similar way to how sunlight illuminates real clay, and create a still render or photograph. I bring that photograph into Photoshop where I apply the final color that you see on the page of the story, blue for Wolf Boy and purple for the Grumble Monster. And there is a picture of the author with his VR headset. And oh, I don't know what I make of that, and I'm curious what you make of that. The first time that I read that, just an hour ago, uh, I was reminded of that famous anecdote on the set of Marathon Man, where Dustin Hoffman was going into all of his method acting nonsense, and Lawrence Libby said, well, why doesn't he just act? <laughs> so, so, I, I read that description, and I thought, well, why, okay, why don't you just draw a children's book, then, w instead of doing this? But am I wrong? Am I being old-fashioned about that? I, it certainly is striking artwork. I just wonder... It's it's cre it's a creative thing. I think I skipped Wolf Boy. I don't think I ever really examined it. So this is fascinating. Him. But anyway, Wolf Boy is scared. Am not. <laughs> he is not scared. So there's another random pile of books. We have Wolf Boy is scared. We have the Rachel incident. Uh, we have Oh God, the Sun Goes, a debut. We have the Art Thief, about an art thief who didn't want to sell what he stole. Just wanted to look at it. We have another dimension of us, where one of the main characters is struck by lightning. No, that doesn't happen every day. And finally, uh, the Mistress of Bacha House, the latest Pervine mystery uh, novel that you're just going to love this series. If you haven't experienced it, you're just going to love it. Uh, so there you go. Uh, another pile of books. I'll just keep throwing piles of books at you, so just get ready for the next one. Uh, I'll wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.